performance organizations do differently? And how do those performances correlate to market performance? Always excited to share our member list. I feel like every, every week this slide gets a few more amazing, um, a few more amazing brands on here. If you're not a part of the I4CP community yet, please reach out to us to join this incredible community. As you can see, we really have a lot of diversity here and the types of organizations that come together to form our community here at I4CP. So if you're interested in joining and getting full access to our research and community, please reach out to us today. Our most recent report is the productivity predicament. And so the full report is going to be available for members only. Another great incentive to join the I4CP community. We've also made a brief of that report publicly available. So for everyone on the call, you can check out a condensed version of this report, which is really going to contain um, a wonderful update um, on the current situation, it addresses a lot of the issues that are um, organizations are facing as they return to work and finding that balance in between productivity and a lot of those culture values that were really valued very highly during the pandemic. So a lot of changes are happening in the market and this brief really dives into those findings. Finally, um, I'm excited to just walk you through a few of the next calls that are coming up. As you know, every week we have a Next Practices weekly call with a lot of incredible speakers coming up in our lineup. So next week we have employee and rec rec recognition and innovation happening at HPE with Samantha Dubridge joining from um, HPE and um, Sile Seal Lucas also joining from HPE. The week after that, the first week of August, we'll be going into talent acquisition transformation at Wells Fargo. And then kicking off after that, our very own Judy Albers and Tom Stone are going to be walking through our AI toolkit, which we know has been a hot topic for all of you here on the call um, and questions that everyone is really facing in their work today. With that, I'm really excited to introduce Jackie Robertson, who almost everyone on this call is very, very familiar with. She is the chair of I4CP CDO board and also the chief diversity and inclusion officer at the Cleveland Clinic. And Eric Davis, who's our creative director and senior editor here at I4CP. And he actually designed that great cover that you were just looking at on the productivity predicament. So if it's particularly hypnotizing to you, you can thank Eric Davis for that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie Robertson. Thanks. Thank Jackie. you so much, Nina. And Eric, your skills are ever evolving and never cease to amaze me. So thank you, good to see you all. Uh, so just uh, indulge me for a couple of minutes here before we get started with our guest speaker who I'm so excited to, uh, to host today. So there's a lot going on in this nation and we're feeling the effects of it. Whether it is the palpable effects of climate change, marginalization of LGBTQ individuals, the recent SCOTUS decision on affirmative action, or the prior decision by SCOTUS on women's health rights and the reversal of Roe v. Wade. It gets a bit overwhelming. I don't know about you, but my escape is walking, hanging out with family and friends. And when I'm really feeling overwhelmed, my go-to is a good Disney flick. Last weekend, I watched Lion King, probably for the umpteenth time, but it never gets old. And the lessons on leadership provides perspective. I know that all of you who are DE&I practitioners are feeling the impacts of so much going on right now. So I'd like to share some of these lessons with you. I think regardless of the obstacles and the pressures, as leaders, we need to continue to lead and engage in productive relationships with our teams and our colleagues. So Lion King provided some key leadership lessons, about nine of them to be exact. Number one, it's less about title, positional power, and more about personal power and action. Number two, life is not fair. Under the tutelage and the gentle guidance of his father, Simba learns how important it is to be kind. Scar kills Mufasa. Simba feels he himself was to blame and goes on to make some pretty bad decisions. Number three, build bridges before you need them. 
Sarabi was this understated powerhouse who held true to who she was, as well as Mufasa's vision. She refused to join forces with Scar, and she kept the loyalty and the pride intact. Number four, have the courage to take on difficult issues. Simba ran away from his issues, and life teaches us, and Simba, that ignoring those issues won't make them go away. Succession planning. Mufasa had a long-term vision to guide and develop Simba to be king. Scar sought immediate gratification to the expense of all <clears> others, <throat> and we know how that ended up. Number six, what we do with our power matters. Mufasa knew who he was. He didn't feel the need to assert himself until it was required. Scar used fear as his weapon of leadership. That's not a sustainable strategy. Number seven, value alignment. Know your values and create a system where the organization knows them and lives them. Think legacy. Mufasa's people were loyal to his vision even after his death. And Scar, well, let's just say the hyenas got their pound of flesh. Number eight, know who you are. I often say, I don't have anything to prove, but I have a lot to accomplish. Mufasa was clearly comfortable with who he was. Scar was smart, cunning, and insecure. And again, we know how that ended up. Number nine, leadership is a responsibility. And unlike Simba's Hakuna Matata philosophy, leadership is far from carefree. I share these with you, not that you don't already know these lessons, but given the times we're living in and the daunting challenges we face as DEI practitioners, sometimes it's just nice to be reminded that we are resilient. DEI leaders are living in constant complexity and we're having to navigate through it. Lion King reminds me that we can put down the books, the phones, the computers, and just sit on the sofa with our favorite snack and be reinforced in the righteousness, the power and the sustainability of living with intentionality, the desire to leave our organizations better than <clears throat> we found them, and the audacity of simple kindness. So with that, I'm excited to introduce our guest to you today, Celeste Warren of Merck and um, she is the Vice President, Global Diversity and Inclusion, Center of Excellence. Celeste, I can't tell you how delighted I am to have you today. Hi, Jackie. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can hear you just fine. Thank you for the invitation to be here today and be able to have a conversation with all of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, one of the things that we like to do with our guests, Celeste, is have them have an opportunity to get to know you a little bit. And so um, I noticed that you chose for the intro song, Ain't No Stopping Us Now. Um, and boy, is that appropriate with all of the challenges facing us. But I want to hear from you. Like, why did you choose that? And why is that so inspirational for you at this moment? Well, I first of all, I love the song. I've loved it ever since it came out decades ago. And yes, I'm dating myself. Um, but there's a there's a, spe a specific refrain in there um, that goes, "We won't let nothing hold us back. We're putting ourselves together. We're polishing up our act." Yes. If you've ever felt held down before, I know you'll refuse to be held down anymore. And then it goes on to say. Don't you let nothing, nothing stand in your way. And so that's sort of a theme song for me. And I hope for others too, especially in the DEI space, because of all of the headwinds that are that are coming our that are here, not just coming our way, but are here. That is so inspirational. You've inspired me. I think I'm gonna put that tune on in my car as I drive back home today. Um, so Merck is obviously very well known. It's a very well-known global brand. So Celeste, can you tell us a little bit about the company and the footprint in the pharmaceutical industry? Sure. Um, Merck is, I, I joke around whenever I introduce myself to a mixed industry audience, but we sell drugs legally. Um, <laughs> we're we're uh, about 69,000 employees, between 65, 69,000 employees globally. We've been in existence for over 130 years. And we operate in over 120, 130 different countries around the globe. Um, we, uh, we have a variety of different products, but we focus in oncology and in vaccines, both uh, pediatric and, and adult. But um, it's just been a pleasure being a part of this organization. I am in my uh, second decade of being in this organization and uh, 
my first time being in the pharmaceutical industry and it's been wonderful, absolutely wonderful from the standpoint of my learning journey and the, the, the mission of saving and improving lives. I so appreciate that, Celeste. And, you know, as we think about complexity and I think about the global nature of Merck, um, I think about your role as chief diversity officer. And can you tell us a little bit about your responsibilities, um, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy you will receive? So I, I know it includes people, it includes culture, supplier diversity, like the world, basically. So talk to us about that. Yeah, it, it is um, our purpose when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion is to compel a more globally diverse workforce for our employees, work environment for our employees. And, and we want to surround them with a culture of engagement, empowerment, equity, um, psychological safety so that they can achieve our mission of saving and improving lives. That's basically our purpose when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion. And we focus in four areas. We focus first in our people, and that's making sure that we have a diverse workforce that mirrors the diversity that we see in our patient base. Secondly, we focus on our culture. We want to make sure that we're surrounding our employees with a culture of engagement, of inclusion, of empowerment, of equity, of psychological safety so that they can do what we've asked them to do when they come into the workplace. We want a workplace where they feel comfortable being their authentic selves and that they can, they can be who they are regardless of how they identify, because that's so very critical to our third priority, which is around our business. In order for us to be able to truly integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion into our business into our drug discovery, development, supply, manufacturing, marketing and sales processes, and then all of those other uh, functions that engage and enable that process. We have to make sure that our employees, we're not just, you know, have we not, it's not that we just need to have a diverse workforce just because we need to have a diverse workforce, but we want to make sure that we're leveraging that diversity that ingenuity, that innovation that comes from different perspectives and different um, ideations, we're making sure that we're leveraging that into our drug, dis drug discovery, development, manufacturing, marketing, and sales processes so we can ultimately achieve the outcomes that we're looking for, which is making sure that there are no obstacles or barriers in the way of our patients experiencing the health outcomes that we want them to experience. And then lastly, our fourth area of priority is around our world. And that is basically making sure that we, we know that we need to be doing what we need to be doing inside the four walls of our organization. But we also have an obligation and a responsibility to lift our heads out of the grindstone mm -hmm. and look outside, look, look externally and say, okay, what is it that we need to be doing to ensure that we are contributing to there being a better world? What are we doing from the standpoint in our area of ensuring that our patients are experiencing the health outcomes that we want them to be experiencing? What's getting in the way? What are those obstacles? What are those barriers? And, and making sure that we're doing the work that we need to be doing. And mm -hmm. you know, you said, Jackie, that we're a global organization. And we feel that our strategy, that strategic framework of uh, our people, our culture, our business, and our world, that no matter where we are around the world, no matter what country, no matter what area of our business, that the strategy is such where it defines our organization globally at an enterprise-wide level, but mm -hmm. also it's locally relevant where no matter where you sit in the organization, mm -hmm. you can look at it and say, okay, what do I need to be doing in the people space? Mm -hmm. What are those areas in our in our part of the country, a part of the business that the haves and the have nots, who, who are underrepresented in our workforce? What are we doing to make sure that we're surrounding them with a culture of uh, inclusion? What are we doing to integrate DEI to make sure into our business to make sure that our patients, um, regardless of their class, economic status, political status, regardless of how they identify, that they are able to have access to our drugs and medicines and services. And then lastly, 
you know, what are we doing in our corner of the world to make sure that we are the neighbor of choice in our community, that people look at us as a, as a leader in the community, no matter where we are. So that's basically kind of it in a, in a nutshell. I love that. And, and just as you talk about your strategy, it was music to my ears to hear you say enterprise wide and locally relevant, because it tells me that not only are you tying your processes to um, um, optimal patient outcomes, um, it tells me that you want to ensure that people see themselves in that strategy. And if it's not locally relevant, that's never going to happen. So beautiful strategy on your part. I, I want to just dive a little deeper in psychological safety. I've been hearing so much about that today. And just curious, have you focused on psychological safety more or differently since the pandemic? What, what has that been like for you? Yeah, we have made that one of the areas of skills and capabilities and competency development for our employees, especially our leaders and our managers, because we feel that psychological safety, when you're really focusing on it and creating that psychologically safe environment, it helps, especially in those um, communities of, of employees that feel marginalized, that feel that they're not valued, that they're not heard. And so that is, it becomes really, really important from a leadership standpoint, from a managerial standpoint, that, that we are creating that environment, especially when we think about return to the office. You know, mm -hmm. many organizations, we are, you know, we're no different from many organizations. We are, um, we have over the past couple of years been gradually returning to office, turning to the office. And so we want to make sure that the office that we return to, that work environment that we return to is safe psychologically for all yes. of our employees, that they they can come into the organization and and feel safe to be themselves, safe to mm -hmm. engage with employees and with that with their fellow colleagues mm -hmm. in a way that is psychologically safe, that they mm -hmm. will stay to elevate their voice and speak up and 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 bring their ideas. Because if we're not doing that, that is foundational to our being able to integrate DE and I into our into our business. And if people don't feel comfortable speaking up and and when they're at the table, let alone being invited to the table, but making sure that they're able to speak up and speak their mind and 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 talk about not just their their functional skills and capabilities, but also their cultural experiences, which will help us bridge that gap between our company and our patients. So psychological safety is absolutely foundational and, and very, very important. And that, that is absolutely amazing and so well said. And when you talk about psychological safety for all, um, talk to us a little bit about what Merck is doing to address the different identities in your workforce. Well, you know, we want to make sure that, it, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. The evolution of identities has, over the, especially over, like in the last five years, has grown so much. Um, you know, BIPOC and various different uh, aspects in the LGBTQ plus community, transgender community, different aspects of how people identify. And so, you know, we it's not that we want to create a, a dictionary of identities, but mm -hmm. just create an environment of learning, an environment where um, it's okay to ask someone, how do you identify? Asking them about their pronouns, asking them about you know who they are because most most people if not all are proud of their identities they're proud of who they are and so being able to engage in that dialogue and that conversation is not just educational but it's fundamental in creating an inclusive environment if we don't have an environment where people feel comfortable coming together and having the conversations around different cultural experiences and identities we truly will not get to a culture of inclusion, because you have to have what seemingly may be an um, uncomfortable conversation initially, but it, just like when you work out and you're trying to build your muscle mass, you, you, it hurts for a little while, but then eventually, you know, you're able to do it really, really well, and you have that, that muscle memory, and we're trying to get to that place where that muscle memory, where people feel comfortable talking about 
their identities and, and approaching it from that and individuality, because, you know, while we identify either as black or Latino or Hispanic or in the Pan-Asian community, et cetera, different, different ways that we identify, the intersection is what's important. The, cu the culmination of all of the ways that we identify is really what's important. And that is at an individual basis. And being mm -hmm. able to, to really make sure that we're highlighting the fact that each of us, each of us is uh, identifies differently than a colleague. And so that identity is important, but there's also many, many different ways that we come together where there are similarities and finding that that the the general themes in that so we can move forward together mm -hmm. as, a, as an organization, I think is really, really important. Very well said. You know, I'm curious, and, and I'm going to open this up, Celeste, in a minute for questions from the audience. So I'm going to turn it back to Nina um, in a second um, to, to find out whether or not we've got any questions or comments uh, from the audience. But I am curious to just dive a little deeper on the, on the pronouns. Mm -hmm. How do you help people who are not accustomed to that make that shift? Does it start with something simple like putting it on your email signature? put it in on your name badges. How do you help people who are not accustomed to asking someone, how do you identify? Get comfortable with that. That's another aspect of diversity. So love to hear your thoughts on that. And, and as you answer, Nina, I'm gonna tee it back over to you to um, find out if we've got any questions or comments from the audience. Yeah, we we started with our one of, two of our employee business resource groups, our Rainbow awesome. Alliance, Okay. And our next gen network, our next gen network is an EBRG that is focused on the next generation coming into the workforce and the integration across all generations. But but um, that gen that that uh, EBRG and then also our Rainbow Alliance, our LGBTQ plus EBRG employee business resource group is what we call them. Um, they came together and launched a campaign to first educate our employees around pronouns, the importance of them, why we are um, inviting everyone to, to identify as far as a pronoun. And so the education came first, and then we put the, the sort of the infrastructure, the systems in place to make it easy for people to put it in their uh, email signature, put it in their system and we have Workday and put it in the system. But it first, it first was educate first and make people aware because, you know, there's a lot, a lot of cynical people out there to say, you know, what do I need to, what do I need to do that for? Why do I need to do that? And so we were able to explain it. And then also too, you know, as I said, we're in so many different global companies and in some countries, it's not evident by the name, whether how someone identifies. And so from the perspective of many, many different dimensions of diversity, just having the pronouns there, I think creates a, a, a better in, inclusive environment. And it, and, it, and it helps to start the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad to hear you're leveraging um, your employee resource groups or, or business resource groups. Research tells us that people who belong to business resource groups are 10% more engaged. Than, than those employees who don't. So kudos to you for leveraging their insights on, on how to create that comfortability with pronouns. So um, yeah, big kudos to you there. At this point, what I'd like to do, Nina, is turn it over to you. Any questions or comments, thoughts from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a couple questions. So I think we'll stay on the track around the pronouns for just a second. So Stacy Hellstrom wanted to get your point of view for organizations around the pronouns, I think, in uh, religiously conservative areas. And I think especially, as you mentioned, being a global organization, maybe that also is impactful in different parts of the world as well. Yeah, I think, you know, from the, so we have uh, 10 employee business resource groups one of which is our interfaith organization. And um, we, we wanna make sure that everyone feels included to be themselves. And, and we respect comments and, and, and discussions and welcome the discussions with differing points of view. But from an inter, we, we didn't have the issue from an interfaith uh, perspective. We had it more from the, 
from a perspective of just people not understanding and, and um, um, the transgender community or um, the, the, especially in this, this newer generation that identify across a myriad of different ways, right? And, um, and helping people to understand that. But, but um, a way that we also expanded the knowledge and the understanding and maybe even the acceptance, if you will, was talking about it from a global perspective. Um, how many times have we, you know, especially had the Zoom meetings or the Microsoft Teams meetings and someone has their name there and they're from a, a different country and it's not evident whether, and they have their, their camera off and it's not evident what, whether that is a, you know, how they identify male, female, they, them, she, her, he, him. It's not evident by the name. And um it becomes kind of, you talk about anxiety in those meetings when that happens. Um, you, the, the person, the people in the meeting don't know what to say. And I've actually been in those meetings where someone uh, came on the line and they didn't have their camera on and they just, their name was just up there and people did not know how they identified. And so even from that perspective, just being able to say, hey, this is who I am and, and how I how I identify, I think it's just very, really, really important. Thank you. Um, another, going down a little bit further down the ERG and BRG, we got a private message here. I think there's just a lot of curiosity because it sounds like you have a very successful program around having ERGs and BRGs at your organization. How are you motivating people to join those and stay involved? And then a follow-up question around that. Let me just make sure I get the wording right. Um, especially as the pandemic has kind of, you know, waned off um, and people's business situations have changed a little bit. How are you keeping people engaged in those groups? Um, well, we we have, as I said, we have 10 employee business resource groups um, across 10 different communities that are open to um, all, regardless of how you identify, you can join any employee business resource group. We also launched last year an ally resource center. And we uh, understand the importance of allies as well. And we, we go with the, the fundamental belief that allyship isn't those in power being the ally to those that are not in power or, or uh, from that perspective. But we, all, we say that everyone should be an ally to others who identify differently than they do. And that takes the power thing out of it. And it's basically, and it creates more of a, everyone has a role in doing something around that space. But, but uh, when we, when our employee business resource groups, we have out of the 65, 67,000 employees, um, over 20,000 of our um, employees are active members of our 10 employee business resource groups. And they fo they focus in three areas. They focus in talent acquisition and development of their members. They focus in customer and business insights, and they focus in corporate and social responsibility. All of our employee business resource groups have to be focused in those three areas. Um, and when we do that, they also have exposure to senior leaders, our CEO, our executive team, and other senior leaders as well. They're ex exposed to business leaders. Um, our EBRG Executive Leadership Council are the, the, the global leads of those 10 EBRGs and we meet once a month and they are the executive leadership team that is the, the um, responsible for the employee business resource groups. And they, we bring at those meetings, we bring in business leaders, we bring in people leaders and they um, use that time to be able to get feedback from the voice of our employees on business strategies, on people strategies, et cetera, communication strategies and all of that. And, and this group, um, they're building their skills and their capabilities as an EBRG leader or as an EBRG chapter leader, or even as a member who's involved in various different projects and assignments. They're, they're evolving and building their leadership skills and capabilities beyond what they do in their functional role. 
We have scientists, for example, they're bench scientists that they don't manage people, they don't lead people, they're not on special projects from a, in, our re, in our labs, but they are a chapter leader of an employee business resource group, and they're building leadership skills and capabilities, they're understanding succession planning, they're understanding budgeting, they're understanding how to manage uh, inclusively, and these things, these skills, they, it takes them into helping them to build their career holistically. So we we don't we don't um, force people to join EBRGs, but we we talk to them about the advantages of being a member. What you were saying, Jackie, about uh, the sense of engagement and feeling valued and the sense of belonging uh, that they feel, which is off the charts but also what they're able to do to enhance their skills and their capabilities when they think about their career aspirations, exposure to senior leaders, being able to talk about feeling valued for what you bring to the table um, beyond your functional skills and capabilities, but being asked your opinion about business strategies and, and, and communication strategies and people strategies based on your culture and how you identify and how that will um, speaking on behalf of your members and how that will um, um, how how it will reflect um, on on members. So it, it is it's just uh, we we continue to 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 promote it from that perspective. And they do a great job. I don't have to do anything. They they are just phenomenal. We've gotten to the point now where a majority of our employee business resource group chapters are outside of the United States in in Latin America, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Asia Pacific. So um, just the work that they've done globally has just been phenomenal. Thank you. You are getting a lot of admiration, I think, and agreement around your intentionality um, and just the business success that you immediately offer folks um, from being a part of your communities, these ERG and BRGs. Eric Davis did just drop a resource for folks that are interested in finding out a little bit more from the I4CP perspective. But Jackie, I know that you've got some additional questions mm -hmm. teed up um, for Celeste. Thank you so much, Celeste. Mm -hmm. I do. So thank you, Celeste. And, and I think that could be another conversation in and of itself in terms of how your um, employee resource groups have developed and evolved overseas and outside of the U.S. So that's another conversation. So I'm going to put you on the spot and promise that you will come back and join us again. <laughs> But now I have a question around something that I have always been so curious about when I watch, you know, pharmaceutical commercials on television. And so they kind of get to the fine print and then they talk about clinical trials. Yeah. And I've always been curious about how does that work? So can you talk at a high level about mm -hmm. the importance of training more minority investigators to improve diversity in clinical trials? No, absolutely, yeah. Jackie. And, and it is when we think about our four components of our strategy, our people, our, our culture, our business and our world, um, the business and world is sort of intersects. But diversity in clinical trials is one of our key priorities under our business pillar. And, you know, people say, well, why do we need diversity in clinical trials? Basically, it's to understand health disparities. And they exist. COVID blew that wide open when we when we when the pandemic came and we saw the disparity that existed across the uh, across the globe, depending on you know various different cultures of communities and identities. But it's to understand why we need diversity in clinical trials is to understand health disparities, those diseases that occur more frequently or appear differently in diverse populations. And so, you know, there are lots of barriers, as you know, Jackie, to diversity in clinical trials. There's lack of trust, lack of awareness. Everybody talks about the Tuskegee experiment and Henrietta Lacks, and there were things that were going on, you know, centuries even before that, just atrocities, but the communities don't forget that. And so there's a lack of awareness and information and access to clinical trials for many, many uh, diverse communities, lack of minority research physicians, and I'll hit on that, implicit bias that exists as well. And then also the, the main thing is many patients of color aren't even asked. The, the physicians don't even think to even ask them, well, you know, do you think you might be interested in a clinical trial? Or if they do ask, 
they don't provide enough information to help um, educate and make um, diverse patients aware and understand it. So the sad thing is, you know, when you look at the Black and the Latino uh, communi uh, communities specifically, about 13% of the U.S. we know is Black, right? For people of African descent. But only 5% of clinical trials across, and this is what the FDA has said, only 5% of clinical trials. In the Latino and Hispanic community, 18% of the U.S. population, only 7% um, in clinical trials. So one of the things that we do, we have a couple of, a lot of different partnerships, but one of the things that I think is has really made a dent in it is our, our engagement with the national media Fellowships, Diversity, and Clinical Trials Research Program. We are heavily, heavily involved in that. We're one of the um, companies that helped to bring that about, along with other companies like Janssen and, and um, uh, AstraZeneca and, and some other uh, pharmas. But it's basically a program that was designed to um, build an understanding around the importance of clinical trials, understanding of what are some of those barriers that get in the way, getting um, understanding of um, helping them to understand it and build awareness and, and equipping them with tools and resources to go from the classroom to applying it every day. And we feel that if we're able to train these physicians, train these cl clinicians and these investigators to help them understand the barriers, the obstacles, the things that get in the way, it will help and translate to increasing the diversity that we see in patients and, and not just in the initial clinical trials, but getting them through the entire clinical trial because of all of those things that I talked about, building awareness and, and, and trust and all of that in those communities. So that is something that we're really, really proud of. And our, our um, deputy chief uh, patient officer, Dr. Luther Clark, was instrumental in creating some of the curriculum for, uh, for that program. And, and one of our leaders, Carmen Villar, she's um, a member of the National Medical Fellowship, which is the program, that, which is the organization that started this program. So I would say out of all the partnerships and all of the things that we do in that space, that, that research program is probably the most influential because it's helping to educate, make them aware, help them understand implicit bias, in, in the system, in the whole ecosystem, and then what they can be doing. So it's actionable things that as soon as they leave the program, that they will um, they will go out and action what they've learned. Wow. I so applaud your efforts as well as your accomplishments um, in that space in particular. And thank you for taking a minute to just explain what Merck is doing in that regard. Um, I do have a question I'm not gonna ask right now because I'm gonna to turn to Nina to see if there's any more questions or comments from the audience. Um, and then Eric is gonna take us through a quick poll, but stick a pen, Celeste, and just think about this question because I'm gonna come back to it. How is the role of the CDO, the Chief mm -hmm. Diversity Officer evolving and changing? But stick a pen in that, I'm not gonna have you answer it right now. Nina, I'd like to turn to you. Any other comments or questions? in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things we're excited to see is a lot of folks coming in internationally for this call, I think particularly because of Merck's global presence. And um, excuse me if I don't get this name quite right, but Bo Mohammed Alian, um, who's a CHRO at a medical facility in Saudi Arabia, um, is dealing with an issue around workplace diversity in their medical facility. And he was wondering, just based off of your experience, we know that Mark does have a presence in the Middle East. Do you have any guidance around how to increase workplace diversity um, in, a, in an area like that in the world? Yes, we, we, um, we have a presence in Saudi Arabia and um, in, in the Middle East. We, so one of the things that we have done is um, we have regional senior leadership uh, diversity task forces. And so we have one for Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, Middle East Africa. We have one for UK and we have one for Latin America. We have one for Asia Pacific. And we leverage um, those councils. We bring together the chairpersons of those councils and the chairpersons are business leaders. We bring them together so they can learn from each other, first of all, uh, around what each of them are doing in the specific areas. 
in those areas of people, culture, business, and world, but specifically around how are we making sure that no matter where we are, that we have a diverse workforce within the organization, regardless of what they may be facing in the country. And so um, one of the things that we're doing in, in Eastern Europe, they are um, uh, making sure that their, their sourcing of, of candidates, that it's coming from various different areas and different organizations. So they're partnering with different associations and different um, NGOs and different um, um, organizations in the country and even neighboring countries as well to say, okay, if we can't, because you can't just put an ad in a paper or, or advertise and think, oh, if we build it, they will come. You have to go out to those different communities and 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 uh, introduce the organization, right? Build the trust, uh, help them to understand who you are as an organization, what you stand for. And then as you're building that trust, then you start the engagement from a talent acquisition perspective. So you have to go where the diverse populations are in your country and build those relationships and then pull them into the organization. That's what's really, really critical. We can't just say, oh, the, the mountain will come to Mohammed. That's not how it works. You have to make sure that you are going to the mountain as an organization. Uh, um, that's one of the things. And then the second thing I would say is make sure you're engaging the leaders of the organization from the top all the way to the top um, um, of the head of that country, because if they don't understand the importance of it, if they aren't um, prioritizing it, it won't get, it won't happen. It, it really, really won't happen. So it starts at the top. It starts with making sure that you have a, a strategy about how you're doing it and going out into those communities where that diverse population is, developing the relationships and the trust and bringing them in. Thank you. Mohammed definitely just reached out directly and wanted to say thank you. So thanks for sharing your insights there. We do have another question coming in, but Eric, I also know that we do have a poll that we want to share. So I'll pass it over to you for now, and we might be able to come back to some additional questions in just a bit here. Great. Um, thank you, Nina. Hello, everyone. Um, well, one of the things we wanted to do uh, with this poll was uh, do a little wellness check because we know that a lot of things have happened in the diversity field. In the U.S. particularly, we've had quite a few things going on with judicial decisions. Um, I kind of wish I had put in a NA option here for some of our global people, but for those with uh, operations, uh, how have you, recent judicial and legislative actions related to DEI affected your personal and or professional sense of well-being? And while we get responses in for this, I was just wondering, Celeste, um, we talked about this a little bit, just the impact on people working in the field. Um, how, how do you feel like the headwinds around things like this uh, in the U.S. have affected you and your colleagues working in DEI? Well, I think, you know, there's a there's an aspect of um, uh, disappointment, fatigue um, in, in how people are responding to, how, how some entities are responding to diversity, equity, inclusion. Because basically, you, you know, you would think that from a moral standpoint that people would say, we want an inclusive environment. We want an inclusive society um, because that's what we're operating off of. We want an inclusive society. Full stop. And we want to do those things that make people feel valued and belonged and and all of those things that we talk about that we want in the organization. We want that from a societal standpoint as well. And so it's very disappointing and disheartening to see that there are people that are fighting the fact that we want an inclusive society for whatever reasons, be they um, personal, professional, out of fear, out of whatever it may be. But but they exist. And so there's a there's a component of just feeling like, you know, gosh, you know, we're just trying to do right. Why isn't that? Why aren't people understanding that? Why are they fighting this? 
for not just for society today, but for our children and our grandchildren for the future of, of the of the world. So there's that piece of it that's just a, just an overwhelming disappointment um, in some of our fellow fellow people. Um, and then there's this other piece that says, but you know what? I'm gonna I, I'm going to live to fight another day. Um, I'm going to rise to the challenge. I am going to fight um, because if I, there are people that are depending on us as chief diversity officers and leaders and practitioners specifically that are depending on us to fight for them when they don't feel powerful enough to raise their voice and elevate their voice and fight. And so knowing that that exists and knowing that that is, um, on us and on our shoulders um, helps us to get up each day. I know it helps me to get up each day, um, knowing that I'm fighting for people that just that sometimes they just don't feel like they can fight or have the power or or energy even. But there is an entity of of you know burnout. You know, the, I saw the latest statistics: the average tenure for a chief diversity officer is less than two years. So there yeah. is a sense of burnout, but. Um, you just have to make sure that you have a place where you 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 energize yourself, and then you go out and you help the help the people and help the world. Well, I think we know you've got ain't no stopping us now going full time in your head, which is great. Um, and we can see from the poll, I think I think a lot of people are answered, hurt, sad, worried, which I think is how a lot of us feel. Just. Uh, um, don't like seeing that step back. You know, you do your two steps forward, one step back, and you get into a period like this. But I think as a community of DEI professionals, as long as, as long as we're here to to take care of each other and make sure we're looking at our own well-being as we go forward in the fight, it's uh, it, it's just important to have your peer groups with you. Yeah. So, yeah. So we had one other uh, poll question we were going to ask, um, and if we want to pop that up, and this is more about organizational responses to what's been going on. So how are recent judicial and legislative actions impacting your organization's current or planned DEI initiatives? Um, I know I have been pinged quite a bit in the last couple of weeks with people asking, how are organizations responding? Um, what should we be doing in light, particularly of the affirmative action SCOTUS decision? Um, and I think even before we knew the decision was coming down, we were telling people, you know, make sure you're pressure testing uh, your DEI initiatives. Make sure that uh, you've got your allies lined up. Make sure that you've got a plan for when you're challenged, because the way things are looking right now, those challenges are going to spill over into the business sector from the academic. So right now we know that, you know, this is pretty narrowly defined towards academia, but it is going to bleed out for the rest of us. So I was just wondering, how has Merck uh, uh, reasserted its commitment to DNI in response to that SCOTUS decision? Yeah, well, as soon as the, um the decision came out, we um, wanted to make sure our employees knew that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only morally correct, um, but it's also um, integrated into our business. We consider it a fundamental, as I was saying earlier, a fundamental way that, that we innovate and create, and, and it's how we drive our, our business and create that inclusive environment for our employees. So we wanted to make sure that our employees understood that from the very beginning, because we knew that there would be concerns, you know, about it as, as there have been around around the nation. And so we got a, a, immediately got a notice out to our employees um, to, to make sure that they understood that. And that was received very, very well and helped to allay some of those fears. Um, and then we also got it externally on our external website, Merck.com, as well for um any of our colleagues and people that we do business with as well. So that was really, really important to just basically get it out there in a timely fashion. And then, you know, our CEO, Rob Davis, our executive team, our you know leaders have been very clear as well 
we sent um, information to our top 200 leaders and made so they could cascade through their respective organizations and add their own spin to it as well. Um, and, and their own words of engagement and encouragement to their employees um, to make sure that they, they understood it from their realm as well. So, um, so everyone could, could hear not just from the CEO and the executive team, but also from their leaders as well. I think that was, that was the critical thing, making sure that everybody understood that, hey, these are our fundamental values and we're not going, that's not going anywhere. That's not changing. Um, and, and, you know, so that was very, very critical. Oh yeah, I, I I think we're kind of in a war of rhetoric in a lot of ways. So making sure that we keep that communication open and just reassert the commitment and not cede that ground is mm -hmm. is a great way to go. So I could probably dig in more on this topic, just like Nina and Jackie have said on theirs. But uh, uh, in response to uh, we've got five minutes left, I will hand this back to Jackie for now. All right, thank you, Eric. So just in wrapping up, Celeste, I, I had one question for you on the evolving role of the CDO, but I'd like you to combine it with the, the final question I was gonna have for you in terms of what are you most proud of? So just briefly, how would you describe the evolving, changing role of the CDO in light of all of these complexities? And what are you most proud of? Yeah, the role of the CDO has evolved. I, I've been in this role now for nine years. And um, when I first got into the role, I was, you know, I'm, I'm I was so, I, I considered myself a novice, you know, it's like, okay, I'm passionate around diversity and inclusion. I understand organizational change from my years of experience um, in the organization. Now let's combine those and, and move forward. But, it, but um, the role of the CDO, we can't be thinking about diversity and inclusion myopically just when it comes to uh, workforce representation, how many people we have, or, um, or, or just about culture as well. The, the chief diversity officer has to uh, have strong business acumen. They have to understand the business. They have to understand uh, what's getting in the way of their being a, a better business performance. They have to understand organizational change. They have to understand politics, they have to understand government relations, both at the federal, the global, and also the state in, in the United States, and understand that impact that it has. They have to understand social media. They have to understand, you know, th those various different aspects of well, uh, as well. But they have to be not just a cheerleader and uh, passionate around diversity and inclusion, but they have to be a practitioner. They have to understand organizational change. They have to understand how the methodology to, to do that as well. It, it, it's, it's just so much more broadened now where you know you saw that it was primarily a, a HR people that were going into the roles and now you see more line leaders going into the role as well. So the backgrounds of the CDOs have, are just evolving. But the thing that is that, that everyone needs to understand, the skills and the capabilities, being able to be an effective communicator through the organization, having that strong business acumen, being able to um, um, understand externally what's happening in the environment and being able to say, what does that have? What, what does that mean for the organization and how do I impact that change? And then last thing, what am I most proud of? I think for me, I'm most proud of the people that I work with that are my diversity ambassadors that are working every day tirelessly in the organization um, to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the, the company. I am very proud to be locked arm in arm with them and in this fight. And um, I just feel honored and, and privileged to be in that space with all of them because it's not about me, it's about all of them and the work that they're doing to create that environment. Could not have said it better. Celeste, thank you again for spending your, your time with us this morning. Thank all of you in the audience who joined us today. Um, I wish you a rest of your great day and a great week to come and join us next time for Next Practices with I4CP. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.